welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and in this video, we want to talk about what we call the No Priesthood Pesach. Now, that's the first Pesach, the first Passover in Exodus chapter 12, when Israel was leaving Egypt suddenly. But the thing is, we should not try to recreate the Exodus 12 Pesach or the No Priesthood Pesach today, because the situation is not the same today as it was back in Exodus 12. Today, Yeshua expects us to be under the rules for a renewed Melchizedekian order. And as we saw before, every time the priesthood changes, the rules or the priestly Torah, the operating instructions for that priesthood, they change. So to see that, we're going to dive deep into the no priesthood Pesach. And we're not only going to see the specifics of what make it up, but we're also going to see which ones we want to keep with us and which ones we want to leave behind because we need to leave some things behind because Yeshua is calling us forward to celebrate his renewed Melchizedekian order, Pesach. So to find out what elements to keep and what elements to let go, please join us for this study. This is information you need to know. As we saw in our study on Torah government, and as we saw in last week's portion about what happens when the priesthood changes in Israel, Israel has already been through a series or a succession of changes to the priesthood. And each time the priesthood changes, the operating instructions, or what might be called the priestly Torah, also has to change. And there's no contradiction in that. That's something that's just written right into the Torah. And so most people need to expand or revise or update their definition of what the Torah truly is. Because as we saw in Torah government and also in last week's portion, in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, it tells us that the patriarch Noah or Noah built an altar to Yahweh and he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So what we see from this is that Although Noah was a patriarch and not a priest, he was able to fulfill the priestly function for his house, but not as a priest for any other house or any other nation. And let's bear this thought in mind because we're going to see it come into play again a little later on in this presentation. If you'd like to know more details on that, I would encourage you to get a copy of Study on Torah Government. We go through all sorts of detail in that study. Now we see a transition take place in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 7. And here's where Yahweh appeared to Avram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And so Avram built an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. But notice he did not offer sacrifices or burnt offerings on that altar. So that's kind of a change. It's a little bit of a transition. In verse 8, then Avram moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to Yahweh and called on the name of Yahweh. But again, he did not offer burnt offerings or sacrifices. So it's kind of a transition. Now we see even more transition in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20, where Melchizedek approaches Avram and says, blesses Avram and says, And blessed be Elohim Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Avram gave to Melchizedek a one-time tithe of all that he had. So what we see there is that Avram tithed, or rather gave a one-time tithe of all that he had to an external Melchizedekian priesthood, meaning... Uh, it was someone external to the line of Israel, Israel still being effectively in the loins of Avram. We see more transition in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse 20, where Avram's grandson Yaakov made a vow, saying, If Elohim will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then Yahweh shall be my Elohim, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be Elohim's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you, 
So here what we see is that Avram's grandson, Yaakov, is effectively promising to tithe. We don't know whether it's year by year, but it's an ongoing tithe. And probably, again, it was to the same external Melchizedekian order that his grandfather Avram had tithed to because the Hebrews are such traditional people. They tend to do what their fathers have done before them. Now, when you take a look at this chart to understand the reason for the changes and what happened in Exodus chapter 12. So we know that there are three main offices in Scripture. Those are the king, the priest, and the prophet. There's also the office of the judge, which is a special combination of all three. We'll talk about that in some other place. But now Avram, or Avraham, was able to serve as both the king and the priest of his own household. And he only had one single heir, being Yitzhak, or Isaac. So when Avram died, he could easily pass along the mantle of the kingship and the priesthood roles to his single heir Yitzhak because there were no other children. He didn't have a need for an established priesthood at that point because there was only one single living ancestor in common. And then the same thing happened for Yitzhak. Uh, Yitzhak also only had one child who was going to receive the inheritance. So Yitzhak also could pass the kingship and the priesthood roles to his single heir, Yaakov, because there were no other children at that point to take into account. However, Yaakov had 12 sons. So when Yaakov or Israel died, there would no longer be a single surviving ancestor in common to unite them or to serve as the king or the priest of the clan. So without a kingship, without a priesthood, the children of Israel would have all gone their separate ways and all unity as a nation would have been lost. So clearly Yahweh had to do something, and it seems like an extreme measure. We might ask, why would Yahweh allow Israel to get sent down into Egypt for 430 years? Why would Yahweh allow them to suffer like that? Well, the reason is Yahweh is an Elohim of order and of organization, but he also likes unity. So it was necessary to take extreme measures to bring about a kingship and a priesthood inside of Israel to prevent that unity from being lost when they left the covering of Egypt. Now, it's important to understand these things, that there is a real need for unity, and because of that, there's a real need for covering. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So now, in the days of the Exodus, 430 years after being sent down into Egypt, the prophet Moshe, or Moses, was able to serve the 12 tribes in the role of a judge. So in this case, Moshe served both as a king and as a prophet. So this, he was able to unify the tribes as effectively the king or the judge of Israel. But the problem is that the people still needed the third office filled. They still needed the office of the priesthood filled. Now, during the Exodus 12 Passover, there was not yet an internal priesthood in Israel. So they couldn't turn to the Egyptian priesthood for help because they were leaving Egypt behind. So the Egyptian priesthood is not going to help them. And then the priesthood of the firstborn wasn't created until after the Exodus 12 Passover. We didn't get the priesthood of the firstborn until Exodus chapter 13. So again, just to, to go over this again, because it's so important and we need understanding to come on this. So Israel had been in Egypt down in the Iron Furnace for 430 years. Now, both Paro, or Pharaoh, and the Egyptian priesthood were external to the nation of Israel. Just like Melchizedek was external in a good way, Paro and the Egyptian priesthood were external to the nation of Israel in a bad way, but to good effect. Now, what I mean by that is, it isn't good to have an external government, and it isn't good to have an external priesthood, because that means that either you're slaves or you're taken captive or your nation is occupied or for whatever reason you're under someone else's rule. You're not able to do the things that you as a people would normally want to do. And that's a very difficult and drastic situation. However, the reason Elohim allowed it is because you have to have a common covering if you're going to have unity. Now, just to comment, 
This is why the Messianic Israel movement, why the Ephraimite movement, and why the vast bulk of the two-house movement has no unity, is because they, well, none of us have a common priesthood at this point in time because we're in the dispersion. That's part of the costs of being in the dispersion. But we could have a common priesthood, except that the book salesmen are teaching everyone against the idea of a common priesthood. And because there is no common priesthood, there is no unity, therefore there is no organization, therefore there is no order. And Yahweh is an Elohim of order. He likes order. That's why he likes organization. That's why he likes unity. That's why he likes a common priesthood. Well, uh, Yahweh allowed Israel to suffer in the iron furnace for 430 years because he wanted Israel to develop a sense of national identity and a sense of national unity. He didn't want all 12 tribes going their own separate ways after the death of Israel. There needed to be some way to forge them together, to melt them together effectively in the iron furnace so that they would no longer have a sense of being independent tribesmen, but now they would think of themselves as the nation of Israel with a common sense of identity as Israelites. So now, after 430 years, there was a sense of being a unified nation, and now they had a judge or a king, the prophet Moshe, to serve in the kingship role, but still they needed a priesthood. They still didn't have a priesthood in common. Okay, so now we're going to take things in sequence. Let's bear this one in mind, and we're going to come back to this in just a little bit. But we're going to pick up the storyline in Shemot or Exodus chapter 11, starting in verse 1. And Yahweh said to Moshe, I'm bringing one more plague, I'm bringing yet one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And after that, he's going to let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he shall drive you out from here altogether. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this term, drive you out. In Hebrew, that's garesh i garesh. Okay, it's the doubling of the verb form. And Yahweh does this whenever he wants to say, you shall surely do something or this shall surely come to pass. Yahweh doubles the verb. So we're going to take a look at this. The doubling of the verb here guarantees us that the Exodus was not a slow event, but that it was a rapid one. We're going to come back to this later, but I wanted to include it here so we keep things chronologically. So listen, just bear in mind, the Exodus had to be a rapid event because that's what Yahweh said it would be. Now we take a look at this word here in Strong's Hebrew Concordance because that's what we love to do is look up words. And it's Strong's Hebrew or Old Testament 1644. It's garash. That's a primitive root. It means to drive out from a possession, especially to expatriate or to divorce, to cast out, to drive away, to expel, to thrust out. Okay, so that's speaking of a very quick action. And the fact that it's doubled guarantees us that it's quick. So now coming back to chapter 11, the second verse, Yahweh then says, speak now in the hearing of the people, because you're going to get driven out very quickly. So speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor, articles of silver and articles of gold. He says, and Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moshe was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Paro's servants, and in the sight of the people. So now, we believe that what this means is that first in verse 1, Yahweh says, you're going to get driven out from here very quickly. So now, speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask now from his neighbor, and every woman from her neighbor now ask for articles of silver and gold. And it says, and Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So we're going to come back to this again a little bit later. But our understanding is that the fleecing of Egypt, the asking and receiving of the articles of silver and gold had to take place before the day of the Passover because they were going to get thrust out very quickly. So Yahweh is saying, you're going to get thrust out quickly. So ask now for the articles of silver and gold. We're going to come back to that later on, but we want to take things in order. So now we come to the commandments in Shemot or Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 3. 
Now, Exodus chapter 12, this is the chapter where the Passover takes place and the thrusting out of Egypt also takes place in this same chapter. So Yahweh says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man, that's a hint, we'll come back to it, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Once again, that's special language. Now, what does this mean? Well, what it means is that each man would have to conduct the sacrifice for his own house because there was not yet a priesthood in common. So this is Exodus chapter 12, and Israel would not receive the firstborn priesthood until the next chapter in Exodus chapter 13. After Israel had already been thrust out of Egypt, that's when the priesthood of the firstborn was commanded. So they couldn't ask the Egyptian priesthood for help because they were going to be leaving Egypt behind. So there had to be some means of having a priesthood because this was effectively a no priesthood Pesach. So in this particular circumstance, each man had to serve as the priest of his own household, effectively a throwback to the days of Noah or Noah. So we continue in verse five with some specifics. Yahweh says, your lamb shall be without blemish, symbolic of Yeshua, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And once again, as we saw, basically we're allowed to take it from the flock. And then under the Levitical order in the next section, we'll see that Yahweh later expands this under the Levitical order also to include cattle, meaning we'll also be able to take the Pesach from the herd. Verse 6. He says, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight or between the evenings. And we'll take a look at that in just a moment. It says, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So basically to mark the house as being obedient to Yahweh. So now we come to Strong's Hebrew or Old Testament concordance because we love doing that. We love looking up words. So that's Strong's Hebrew 996, and the word there is bain. Now, basically just means between or betwixt. So, okay, so between or betwixt the evenings. And then we come here to Strong's Hebrew 6153, and the word there is erev. So it's from 6150. It means dusk or evening or evening tide, basically. So between the evenings is what Ben HaErevim means. But what does it mean between the evenings? Well, um, some translations and some people tell us that it means at sunset. But the problem is it takes effectively two or three hours to dress out and cook a lamb, depending on how expert you are at it. I'm sure some people can do it quicker than that. But probably it's a good bet. Uh, most people are going to need two or three hours to dress out and then cook a lamb. And if we wait until sunset, then there's not enough time to do that. So it's uh, basically in Hebraic thought, there are two evenings and one is basically at noonday. And then one is also at dusk. So noonday being when the sun is starting to come back to earth. And then dusk is again, when the sun is at the earth, So there's this point in between those two periods of time at about 2.30 in the afternoon or so where it's between the two evenings. So basically this refers to what we might call mid-afternoon when the sun has just begun to descend, but it has not yet set. So that's what the term Bein HaErevim means. Now we see a similar second witness to this in Devarim or Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 6. It says, but at the place where Yahweh or Elohim chooses to make his name abide. Now, this is a commandment to the Levitical order. We're not trying to incorporate this in the no priesthood Pesach at all. Uh, We'll talk about this hopefully in next week's teaching. But Yahweh says, at the place where Yahweh or Elohim chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Pesach in the evening when the sun comes back to earth at the time you came out of Egypt. So, and then in Hebrew, the term there is kavo hashemesh, meaning when comes the sun. So when the sun comes back to the earth. So if you can imagine, you have the sun going up and then the sun is above for 
uh, the noon portion, the mid portion of the day, and then about 2.30, the sun begins to start coming back down to earth. So uh, this basically harmonizes with the definition in Exodus. Okay, returning back to Exodus 12, and then in verse 8, Yahweh says, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. He says, And thus shall you eat it, with a belt on your waist, with your shoes on your feet, we'll talk about that word in just a moment, and with your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste, because remember, just one chapter earlier, Israel was told they were going to be thrust out of the land of Egypt in haste, and the verb was doubled, so it means they would have to leave so very quickly. He says, it is Yahweh's Passover. He says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the false gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. Okay, so... We've seen that he's saying in haste. Let's take a look at that in the next slide. But this term, your shoes, some versions translate that as sandals. No, there's not a commandment to wear literal sandals. Uh, the verb in Hebrew there, the word is na'alechem, and it means what you go upon. So basically what you, what you walk upon. So it could be sandals, it could be shoes, it could be boots. It's your choice. But whatever it is that you're walking upon. Now, this word in haste, that is Strong's Hebrew or Old Testament Concordance 2649, that's chipason. So, and that comes from the 2648, and it means hasty flight. So it means, again, haste. So we look up the root word there in 2648, that means to start up suddenly or to hasten away, basically, as because of fear. So in other words, in, in many different ways, Yahweh is telling us that the exodus was going to be a very hasty event, and they were going to have to suddenly leave. So again, that's why it had to be the fleecing of Egypt, the asking of articles of silver and gold, had to take place before the day of the actual Pesach. Now what we've seen before is that Yahweh's feasts are effectively prophetic shadow pictures, or they're rehearsals of coming things. So he's showing us the things that he plans to do in the future, and he wants us to rehearse what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Now, just to use a military analogy, that's why they do battle drills in the militaries, because when you enter into conflict, when you enter into combat, you basically fight like you train. So what you do in training, that's what you're going to do in battle, because when fear kicks in, the brain shuts off and the body just responds from instinct or the body responds from training. So you have to have the appropriate drills in place. You have to have the appropriate rehearsals in place. And it makes all the difference what it is that we're rehearsing to do. Because what we rehearse, that's going to determine how we behave. That's going to determine how we respond when we reach that kind of a very difficult flight situation. So now we need to talk about something very different and important. Now, we saw in earlier sections, in earlier chapters, that Yahweh's feasts are effectively prophetic shadow pictures or rehearsals of coming things. Basically, they're rehearsals of things, how we're going to respond for what he does in the future. And if I could just speak to this just kind of in a military analogy, uh, in the army, there's a saying that you fight like you train. So whichever way you train, whichever way your battle drills indicate that you should go, that's what you're going to do when combat happens. Because when things start to break loose, basically the brain shuts down and the body starts to behave from instinct and from training. Whatever your drills are, that's what you're going to do in times of conflict because the brain's going to turn off. So whatever it is that we train to do, whatever it is that we rehearse to do, that's what it is that we're going to do. So when we take a look, the Israelites ate the no priesthood Pesach standing and dressed with their shoes on their feet and girded for flight because they were preparing to flee Egypt suddenly. So if we want to leave Egypt or the world system, shouldn't we also eat the Pesach standing and dressed 
with our shoes on and girded for flight as if we're preparing to go back home suddenly. So it's a question. Now, uh, we're going to talk about this just a little bit. and We'll talk about it more next week. But in contrast, our rabbinic brothers, they don't stand for the Pesach. They could be living in the land of Israel. They could be somewhere else in the dispersion, outside the land of Israel. It doesn't matter. They're going to sit down at a table and perform what they call a Passover Seder service. And the word Seder means order. So we'll talk about this in more detail in the next chapter. We'll see that Yeshua may have eaten the Last Supper as a form of a Passover Seder service. And the reason why is because they weren't rehearsing to leave Egypt to go back to the land of Israel. They were already in the land of Israel. So they were rehearsing staying in the land of Israel. Well, okay, that's fine if you're living in the land of Israel and things are stable. In other words, you're not living under defiled Babylonian government. You're not living under democracy. Uh, and the abomination that makes desolate isn't going to get set up. Uh, but we already know. And uh, so I just want to speak to uh, those from the Jewish side of the house, because I don't think there's anything wrong with being loyal to your house. I, I don't begrudge any Ephraimite being loyal to the house of Ephraim. I don't begrudge any Jew being loyal to the house of Judah. But let's be real about this. We need to, first and foremost, we need to be loyal and faithful to Elohim and to Yeshua and what Yeshua has said for us to do, which is the Great Commission. We'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, basically, the, we're already told that when the abomination that makes desolate is set up in the set-apart place, or basically on the Temple Mount, then let him who is in the land flee to the mountains. So we already know that those of us who are in the dispersion are going to want to go home, and those who are in the land of Israel are going to need to flee. So what sense does it make to do a sit-down Seder? At this point in time, shouldn't we be rehearsing fleeing, even if you're from the Jewish side of the house, and even if you're already living in the land of Israel, doesn't it make more sense to rehearse fleeing? Because that's what you're going to have to do. Okay, now this is another one that Yahweh impressed on me back in 2017. The current mission is not to go back home to the land of Israel. Uh, I remember uh, before I spent I don't know how many years I spent in the two house movement trying to find a way for Ephraim to come home to the land of Israel until I finally realized that's not what Yahweh wants Ephraim to be doing right now. Yahweh wants Ephraim to be fulfilling his son's great commission uh, by means of the great commission and the fivefold ministry. And what Yeshua tells us is that we should go and make disciples in all the nations, immersing them in his name teaching them to keep or obey, to shomer, to guard all the things that he has commanded us, which when we take a look, we've talked in many places, all the things that he commands us is effectively to set up a network of congregations and a global Melchizedekian government that's going to be used to rule and reign over the nations after Armageddon during the millennium. So, and if anyone wants to know why we immerse in Yeshua's name only, that study is in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3. But that's effectively what we're supposed to be doing right now. We're not commanded to be dwelling in the land of Israel. That's not our purpose right now. That's not our point. And there's nothing wrong with being a witness to Yeshua in the land of Israel if that's how Yahweh is leading you. Right now, we're just talking about, is there logic behind a sit-down Passover Seder? between rehearsing, sitting down, and staying in the land of Israel at this point when we know the abomination of desolation is coming and we're going to have to flee the land of Israel at that point. Doesn't it make more sense as a believer in Yeshua to practice a stand-up Pesach? And we'll talk about that both next week and also when we get to the section on the Melchizedekian Pesach. So, okay, so basically we have a dress rehearsal right now for the second exodus. So whether we're inside the land of Israel or outside the land of Israel, what are we rehearsing for? Okay, well, we're not rehearsing sitting down to remain in the dispersion. Okay, Brother Judah, who's in the dispersion, uh, and they're sitting down, that's what they're rehearsing is sitting down outside the land of Israel. 
Okay, and there's prophetic significance. Brother Judah would admit that there's prophetic significance to everything that happens, meaning everything that we do. So you know, isn't our goal rather to return to the land of Israel after Armageddon? So, okay, so basically we should all be rehearsing to leave Egypt and go home right now. Okay, returning to the narrative, Shemot or Exodus chapter 12 in verse 13. Now, this is the specific situation in Exodus, in the no priesthood Pesach, Yahweh says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now that's situation specific. We're going to see that's going to change under the Levitical order. Or we're going to see it's going to change again under the Melchizedekian order. So stay tuned for that. He says, so this day shall be to you a memorial. Now, this part is a precept. This is a principle. This, verse 14, does not change. He says, so this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. When you see the word throughout your generations, you should think, ah, this is a precept. This is a principle. This one doesn't change. He says, and you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Okay, so that's, it doesn't change when he says that. Then he says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Okay, that's a precept. That part never changes. And on the first day there shall be a set-apart rehearsal. And on the seventh day, there shall be a set-apart rehearsal for you, meaning a gathering, an assembly. No manner of work shall be done on them, but only that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. Again, that's a precept. That's something for all time. 17. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations. Precept as an everlasting ordinance. That's a precept. On the first day of the month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Those are all precepts. And the reason I emphasize the term armies up there is it's just amazing how many people in Ephraim, I don't know if Judah has the same problem, but there's so many people in the Ephraimite side of the house that just can't seem to get past the concept that we're supposed to be organizing. Yahweh is an Elohim of order. Order takes organization. You don't have a priesthood. You don't have organization. And the renewed covenant commands a Melchizedekian order. We've covered that in many different places. So Yahweh's calling us out of Egypt as his armies. So what about that doesn't require order and organization? So, I mean, it's just a question. Verse 19. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. Once again, that's a precept. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. Once more, it's a precept. So... What we see, basically, is that Yahweh wants us to eat unleavened bread from the, the evening ending the 14th day, the conjunction of the 14th and the 15th. So the Passover is sacrificed or slaughtered on the afternoon of the 14th, and then the meal is eaten at the start of the 15th, the evening beginning the 15th. And then we continue to eat until the end of the 21st day or the start of the 22nd day. And we're not supposed to have any leaven in our houses or on our property during that time. Okay. Now we're going to come back to this concept of leaving in haste. So in Exodus chapter 12, we're following chronologically. So in Exodus chapter 12 in verse 33, it says, And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. We already saw that word. For they said, We shall all be dead. Our firstborn children are dead. We're all going to die. So the people took their dough before it was even leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. And okay, now the children of Israel had already done 
according to the word of Moshe, and they had already asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And Yahweh had already given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. We saw that before. So that they granted them what they requested. And thus Israel plundered the Egyptians. And the reason we bring this up is because from time to time you will hear about this alternate calendar theory, sometimes called the early 14th theory. Sometimes it's called the conjunction of the 13th and 14th theory. And uh, one of the reasons that theory is wrong uh, we'll give you we we'll give more details in the Torah calendar study. If you if you want to know why that is wrong, uh, please refer to the Torah calendar study. But basically, the early 14th theory or the conjunction of the 13th and 14th theory requires the Israelites to plunder the Egyptians during the time of the hasty exodus, during the time of being driven out and being thrust out. But it doesn't work because there's no time because Yahweh emphasizes again and again, that it was going to be a quick, hasty exodus. I mean, he gives all kinds of clues to this. So, I mean, they didn't even have enough time for their, for, to cook their food. So, uh, anyway, if you want to know more details on that, please refer to the Torah calendar, study on the Passover. Verse 39, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared, prepared provisions for themselves. So that's why the early, 13, or the early 14th or the conjunction of the 13th and 14th theory just doesn't work because there just is no time for it. There's too many witnesses to it. So again, if you have questions on that, please refer to the Torah calendar study. But again, it says, verse 51, And it came to pass on that very same day that Yahweh brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. Meaning, again, according to their organization. So we have to have organization and order in order to be fulfilling the Pesach. So now we need to talk about the principles that we've seen. Because really what we're doing here is we're taking a look at the no priesthood Pesach. Because we're trying to understand what are the changes that have happened from when we had the Exodus 12, no priesthood Pesach? And then we're going to talk about the Levitical Pesach. Then we're going to talk about Pesach in the first century. And finally, we're going to talk about the Melchizedekian Pesach. So we need to take a look at what are the changes that have happened in between these Pesachim so we can understand what is it we should be doing in the Melchizedekian Pesach and why. So let's take a look and let's extract some principles and some precepts and see what things we need to keep and then also what things we need to leave behind. Now, some of the principles that we've seen is that Yahweh's Pesach is effectively a preparation to leave Egypt or the world system. It can be a preparation to leave the physical land of Egypt as in Exodus 12, or it can be a preparation to leave spiritual Egypt, whether in the dispersion or whether we're in the Jewish exile or whatever we're still in. Uh, but it also includes those of us who are still living in a Babylonian land of Israel under democracy. Okay, now, take a look at things that are coming up. In order to prepare to leave Egypt, what Yahweh says is that we should be ready to go. Okay, we should be clothed and standing, have our belt on, have our shoes on our feet and our staff in our hand and be ready to travel and also be ready for action, be ready to protect our families come whatever may. And so to rehearse that, we dress this way, and we also eat the Pesach in haste, as if we're ready to be driven out at any moment, basically to be ready. Now, some other principles that we see in the Torah calendar study and also in Revelation in the End Times, what we saw is that the first Pesach, or the first Passover, had a sudden exodus, followed by 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, such that the generation changed. Now, in contrast, in the second exodus, we're basically expecting 40 years of increasing persecution, followed by a sudden and hasty second exodus. So, when we think about that with relationship to the news, it makes a lot of things clearer. So now let's keep these principles and precepts in mind as we move forward through this study. Because 
in this section, we've been talking about how we keep the Pesach when there's no priesthood. Next week, we're going to see how Elohim wants us to keep the Pesach under a cleansed Levitical order. After that, we're going to take a look at the way the Pesach was kept in Yeshua's time in the first century. And then finally, once we extrapolate the lessons from all those, we'll be able to understand how Elohim expects us to keep the Pesach today under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. Please stay with us. This is important information that anyone who wants to keep the feast the correct way under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order needs to know. Shalom.